Turn it up, swashbucklers! You're listening to Under the Crossbones, episode number 166. My name's Phil Johnson. I'm your host for the show today. Thanks for tuning in and telling your friends and visiting sponsors and sending donations and doing all that cool stuff that you do that helps me keep the old boat afloat. I appreciate it. Uh, if you are uh, an American listener, uh, happy Thanksgiving. or It's coming up this week. Uh, and if uh, if you're not or you're anybody else, uh, I don't know, thank something. Just, just, you know, be thankful for something, whatever it is that might be around you. Uh, but more importantly than Thanksgiving, you know what uh, the same day, uh, November the 22nd is? It's the 300th anniversary of Blackbeard's death. Yeah, that's the part we've been looking forward to all year, right? How is that the same day? Uh, Blackbeard, by the way, I looked it up. In 1718, uh, it, it was a Tuesday. Blackbeard was killed on a Tuesday on November the 22nd, 1718, which means he was probably just on his way home. Uh, for some Thanksgiving, right? He's just like, he and the crew are like, man, we're going to go eat some turkey, some stuffing, and some cranberry sauce. And oh no, where's my head? Uh, and uh, But actually, that's not that's not even true because Thanksgiving didn't become a federal holiday until 1863, uh, which the timing on that seems, seems a little bit uh, strange to me. 1863. Uh, you thought the political discussion at this year's Thanksgiving was going to be awkward with your relatives. How about 1863? <laughs> A year before the Civil War was ending, yeah, I think it was. Uh, I think that was the government just trying to get everybody to sit down and just, just, just get everybody to sit down and eat some damn turkey. Just shut up and quit shooting each other for a moment. Eat some turkey. Eat some stuffing. We'll continue shooting each other tomorrow uh, on the twenty third of Thursday. Uh, the twenty. I don't know what it was. I don't know what day it was. It was the last Thursday of November. So anyway, uh, Blackbeard probably not going home for Thanksgiving, but. He was probably going to go home and eat something and uh, losing your head tends to ruin that uh, right, ruin that plan just a little bit. My guest on the show today is Eric J. Dolan, author of Black Flags, Blue Waters. And uh, this is a new pirate book uh, is centered. This is a great week for this because it is specifically centered around American pirate history, uh, mostly off the East Coast, because that's where it was happening. Uh, not a lot of not a lot of pirates out of Oregon, Northern California, uh, because we weren't a thing yet. Uh Right? Do I have my dates right? Yeah, no, we weren't a thing yet. Uh, and so uh, it's East Coast American piracy. A lot of names you know, a lot of names you don't know. It's a really great book uh, with a lot of angles in it that I had not seen uh, or read about before, which I think is very cool. Uh, well, you'll find out about uh, an even earlier clash between Americans and Muslim ships well before the Barbary Wars. That was pretty illuminating. Uh, you'll find out the combination of factors that did eventually take down the Golden Age pirates. It wasn't just Woods Rogers showing up with a, you know, uh, with a, a salute and a jaunty uh, jacket uh, or whatever and taking them down. That wasn't just it. There were a lot of uh, factors that went into it. And you know what you're going to learn about in this interview? A lot is uh, duck stamps. Uh, you're going to learn a lot about duck stamps uh, to add to all your previous duck stamp knowledge, which I'm pretty sure is zero duck stamp knowledge. Uh, so anyway, we talk about that for a couple minutes. It's it's in context. You'll understand why once you get in there. But this is a really great interview with Eric J. Dolan. And the book itself, uh, Black Flags, Blue Waters, very entertaining. Even if you've read a bunch of other pirate books and, and there's stuff in there that you've heard before, it's still a very entertaining read. It's an easy read. Uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit. So we're going to talk to Eric J. Dolan here in a second. Uh, I had a Good weekend. I did some shows. I played a place called uh, Comedy Oakland on Friday night. And this is a place I've been playing for years at the various locations that they have been at. And uh, it has become a difficult room for me. Not because uh, they are uh, not a good audience or whatever, but just that my particular choice of material does not always jive uh, with what I do there. So I sometimes have good shows, sometimes have not so great shows. Uh, and I went over there the other night and the crowd was a little slow to warm up for the first couple comics. And it was a late show. Uh, a late show Friday is always a dicey uh, is late show Friday is the reason Steve Martin quit comedy, according to him. Uh, so late show Friday is always a dicey prospect. Uh, and they were a little just the energy wasn't quite there. Uh, the comic before me uh, got them going pretty well. And then I went up and had a gangbuster set, like a set like I haven't had in that room for quite a while. Uh, I like riffed a good three, four minutes of material right at the beginning about my recent trip to Arizona and Nevada. And it was just like just things were clicking. I was on uh, the timing was right. And uh, just uh, everything was just going to f just full. 
full speed ahead comedy machine. And of course, I got off stage and realized that I had not set up my video camera. Uh, and it's always the sets you don't tape are the ones that you should have taped. So there is no proof of uh, this miraculous, wonderful set. I, well, it, it was not the set of a lifetime. It was a good set. I was happy with it. But I do wish I'd had it on tape because I tried, funny, the next night I tried that same uh, material that I'd riffed at the beginning of the show the previous night. Did not work nearly as well. Sometimes you just catch lightning in a bottle. And uh, sometimes uh, the lightning is not there the, the next evening. Next evening was good. I was in uh, Los Banos, California, which I've uh, I've been to Los Banos, but I've never stopped there before. Uh, so I played a brewery there. That was a pretty fun show that I'll be going back. Uh, I'll be going back to uh, because they bought a ton of merchandise. And uh, thank goodness for people who do that. But uh, there are a bunch of tour dates coming up here. Uh, November the 21st. Yeah, night before Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving Eve, if you will. If uh, if your family's already in town, you can bring them to this. Uh, or if you're trying to get away from them already, yeah, you can do that too. Uh, November the 21st, I'll be at the, Al- Ur- uh, it's called the Urbano California Bistro in Modesto, California. Because, uh, you know, who doesn't want to spend Thanksgiving Eve in Modesto, California? November the 28th, I'll be at the Outpost Saloon in Waterford, California. Uh, December 6th, Free Wheel Brewing in Redwood City, California. December the 9th, uh, I'll be doing a Toys for Tots benefit that I'll be headlining at a P.F. Chang's in Walnut Creek, California. Now, I never thought I'd be playing a P.F. Chang's because that's not usually a place that is on the dream venue list, but it's for a good cause. We're going to raise some money. We're going to collect some toys for Toys for Tots. uh, December 9th, P.F. Chang's, Walnut Creek, California. Uh, December the 12th, I'll be at the Mill Casino in Coos Bay, Oregon. Two shows that night, headlining both. December the 13th, uh, the Mount Shasta Vets Club in Mount Shasta, California. And December 14 and 15, I will be at Chadwick's in Medford, Oregon. Uh, Those are all, as far as I know, yeah, I think those are all headlining shows. So it's going to be good. Uh, After that is more Oregon, Washington, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Florida. All that stuff is on the calendar. Go to underthecrossbones.com, click that tour dates button, and you can find out when I am coming near you to tell some jokes and sing some songs. We are sponsored today by Parada Clothing. Yeah, their brand new website is a gosh darn pirate utopia of shirts, hats, clothing, swimwear, more, all steeped in the lore of pirates and treasure. Perfect for your next Caribbean cruise or trip to the Keys and new stuff added every week. And of course, hey, Christmas shopping time. Don't don't drag your heels on that one. Christmas shopping time. You know some people who like pirate stuff? I'll bet you do. Cause duh. And uh, so go over and check out paradaclothing.com. It's real classy looking stuff. It's stuff that you can wear uh, it, when you can't wear your gear out in public uh, without freaking people out, right? You don't want to, you don't want to be wearing a sword and a flintlock, a, a pistol to the grocery store. Uh, people will look askance at you when you're just trying to buy some bananas. So sometimes uh, you got to be a little more subtle and that's cool. You put on your Parada clothing and everything will work out fine. Go check it out at ParadaClothing.com and be sure to click that ship wheel on the website to get in on Blackbeard's treasure hunt. So go now, ParadaClothing.com. And if you need uh, like a discount, uh, you, uh, who doesn't want a discount, right? Do this, text the word pirate to 21000. Do that, grab your phone, text the word pirate to 21000, and they'll send you a discount. How awesome is that? Again, that is ParadaClothing.com. Oh boy, are you enjoying the show, uh, the the run of the show? We are uh, almost 120,000 downloads, uh, and uh, there's all sorts of great stuff. I was just looking at the stats today, and uh, you guys are doing fantastic work out there, helping me spread the word. Come join us over on Facebook, facebook.com slash under the crossbones on Twitter, we're at under crossbones, no the, and do make sure you click that subscribe button in whatever app you're listening to this, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Slacker, Overcast, Podcast Attic, uh, wherever, wherever you're listening to it, there's a subscribe button and you can click it. That'll make sure that you get all the new episodes as soon as I put them up uh, every week on uh, Tuesday morning, Monday night, if you're really diligent, because technically it goes up at Monday night, 9 p.m. here on the uh, West Coast. But that's just West Coast. You know, we like to do things a little early or late or not at all. And of course, you can get all the show notes for this episode at underthecrossbones.com slash 166. Yeah, Uh, let's do this. Let's get into it. Let's get let's talk to Eric J. Dolan. We're going to do this now. So Eric J. Dolan is the author of Black Flags, Blue Waters, a new book out about pirate history, specifically American pirate history. And it is fascinating. It's a really great read. So here we go. This is Eric J. Dolan. Your new book is called Black Flags, Blue Waters. And 
Uh, I think the first thing I want to ask you is why in the sea of pirate books that are out there, uh, would you want to write another pirate book? Uh, tell, and I, I've just about finished it. I'm about 40 pages from the end. It's really a great book. Uh, but what was the, what was your angle going into it where you thought I need to write a pirate book? Thanks for reading the book. I really appreciate that. Uh, the, my angle of entry for this book, uh, I have to sort of go back to the initial idea and that, uh, was sparked by both of my kids. I just finished a book called Brilliant Beacons, uh, History of the American Lighthouse. And I was looking around for another book topic. So I decided to pitch a few ideas to my teenage kids, Lily and Harry. And okay. one of the ideas I had been mulling over was a book on pirates. And when I mentioned that to them, their eyes lit up. They said, that's what you have to write. You have to write a book on pirates. And I got really excited because I've written 13 books and neither of them had read any of my books thus far. <laughs> and uh, the good news is since Black Flags, Blue Waters came out, my daughter has read the book and she likes it. And my son, Harry, promised that he will get to it eventually, maybe maybe <laughs> by the time that he's uh, 50. But th that was just the initial idea. But I have to step back a little bit because my publisher, uh, Live Right, which is an imprint of W.W. W. Norton, I've done four books with them before. So we have a pretty close relationship. So they asked me to come up with a number of potential topics and just write a page on each one. Okay. So I had about eight topics, and one of them was to write a book on pirates, but I didn't write an entire page. I basically said, you know, I'd love to write about pirates. I don't know a lot about them, but I've been looking around, reading different books, and there's something there, I, th I think, but I'm a little concerned. There are so many books out there. I'm not sure what I can contribute that's new. Uh -huh. So when I got on the phone with my uh, publisher – to talk about the different topics, I thought they would pick one of the other topics that I had selected. So I was shocked when they said, we want you to write the book about pirates. And I said, did you read what I wrote that there's, <laughs> there's too many books about pirates? And this is actually what they said. I'm not saying this just because I'm being self-serving. They said, well, there's never been an Eric J. Dolan book about pirates. And I couldn't disagree with that. But really, I believed at that point, after I, I went off for another month, I did a lot more reading. And I believe that there was room for a new type of book. And that's one that focuses on the pirates of America, the ones that came from American colonial shores during the Golden Age and the ones that attack ships along the shores of the American colonies. And I was convinced, and I am even more convinced today, that there is no other book like this. There is no other comprehensive narrative history of the pirates from the late 1600s through the early 20th, uh, early 1700s, focusing mainly on those pirates that have a relationship to the American colonies. There are a lot of books that talk about bits and pieces of what I talked about, but I defy anybody to find another book that does what I did as comprehensively as I did it and in a way that I think is easy for readers to absorb and, and understand and, and understand the arc of history. Because a lot of my books, what they do is they take a topic, they're really about American history, and they use a specific topic as a narrative backbone. So I feel that even though this book is definitely about pirates, <clears throat> and there's a lot in it about pirates, it also gives you a broader entree into the world of colonial America and how pirates were affecting that world. So I'm very happy with how it turned out. I believe it is a good, new, and vibrant contribution to the literature. And certainly I'm getting a lot of good feedback, both from people who, like me, when I began the book, are unfamiliar with the history of pirates, as well as I've gotten a lot of good feedback from people who are well versed in pirate history and they really are enjoying the book. So I think I've accomplished the mission I set out at the beginning. And of course, the most important mission was writing a book that my kids would think is cool. And <laughs> that, that seems to have worked as well. <laughs> yeah. And, and I totally agree because uh, getting into it, I uh, at first I was like, OK, another pirate book. And I've read, obviously, loads of pirate books. And so have uh, my audience and the people in the pirate community. And I got into it and I was like, OK, first of all, if you know a lot of this stuff, this is just a really great 
um, almost like a refresher read where it's, it, it's, it's a, it's a quick read. It's, uh, it's not a difficult textbooky kind of thing. Uh, and it's it, right. very engaging. You really do take us into the scenes very well, but I had never, you're right. I had never seen that distinctly American angle put on the thing before. And I think that's because there's kind of two camps in the pirate scene. And there are those who live along the West coast and experience that sort of East coast, pirate history on a very regular basis because it's part of the cultural fabric of those states. And then there's the rest of us where we think of pirates being in the Caribbean or being English and Spanish and things like that and don't necessarily think about the American angle on it. So uh, yeah, you're right. There was a, a hole in the pirate literature for that. And I think you did a very good job with it. Thanks. <laughs> and and certainly and like you said with because uh, I did see your blurbs from David Cordingly and Richard Zacks and guys like that so uh, they they apparently enjoyed it as well so that's a good thing. There was one thing early in your book that uh, I did not know as much about that I thought was very interesting um, was that they were attacking a lot of Muslim ships uh, early on in that in the period that you're discussing here right. was uh, basically American pirates attacking Muslim ships and. The reason I bring that up is because for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about a lot of uh, the Barbary pirates, the Somali pirates happening in modern culture right now. And I don't think people know a lot about the American pirates attacking Muslim ships in that part of the world prior to the Barbary pirates, which is another you know, 40, 50 years later. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. That's the part of the book that I found most fascinating because it was most surprising. Before 1700, there were a whole bunch of these so-called Red Seamen, who emanated from the American colonies and ships. They got letters of mark or privateering licenses from corrupt governors who took kickbacks to give them these licenses during King William's War that gave them permission to attack the French because the English and the French were then at war. But of course, these so-called privateers had no intention of attacking the French, but they instead went around the Cape of Good Hope into the Indian Ocean, where they attacked these Mughal ships, which were, in fact, ships that were either owned or manned by Muslims coming from what we call India today and heading to the Red Sea and the ports of Jeddah and Mocha. And the, the most valuable of those ships were the ones that traveled to <coughs> those ports during the Hajj or the Muslims' holy voyage to go to the city of Mecca. Mm -hmm. So these American pirates, and there were scores of them over a period of about 10 years, a little bit less than 10 years, they uh, went into the Indian Ocean. They attacked these sometimes lightly defended Mughal ships and came back, many of them, with a lot of treasure, not just money and money, uh, silver and gold, but also silk and uh, other fabrics and tea and all sorts of East Indian goods. And while this was great for the colonies and the colonists often welcomed these people back in to the colonies with open arms because they were, after all, the sons, fathers, and brothers of the colonists themselves who had gone to the Indian Ocean, enriched themselves, and then in turn enriched the colonies, Britain or the mother country uh, took a much dimmer view of their activities because even at that time, piracy was against the law. And the bigger problem was that by attacking these Mughal ships, these pirates were damaging the valuable East Indian trade of the East India Company out of London, which that, that trade was a major bulwark of the British economy. So while the colonists were in favor of this kind of piracy or even privateering, as they called it, the mother country was totally opposed to it, and this created a major point of friction well before the American Revolution. It was a time when the colonies were thumbing their nose at the central authorities, in part because they didn't have representation in parliament, in part because they were often starved of currency by the mother country, and they were treated uh, as many colonies of Britain were treated at the time as subservient to the central government and only there to provide Britain with goods and money. So it created this dynamic tension that ultimately ended in a crackdown on piracy in the colonies that was rather effective. And by about 1700, there was an almost elimination of piracy in the Indian Ocean coming from the colonies, <clears throat> as well as uh, some 
homegrown piracy that was ha- happening a- along the shore of the American colonies. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that, you know, 1770, 1780, they're all of a sudden going, we have no idea why these Barbary pirates are attacking our ships <laughs> uh, as if they didn't remember what happened, you know? Um, yeah. So I thought that, I thought that was, that was one thing that I, I really learned about in the book that I hadn't thought about before. How much have you thought about what the American picture, the American colony picture would have looked like at that time had the piracy not been a economic force in what was happening then? That's a good question. It's a, it's also a, a tricky question, trying to figure out what the course of history would have been absent an important or significant historical force is always a dicey proposition. Sure. Given that we, <laughs> it's even hard to predict what's going to happen if you know what's happened in the past. <laughs> right. But if if I had to hazard a guess, I think without the contribution of these Red Sea pirates in particular, there would have definitely been less tension between the colonies and the mother country at the time. There would have been less money flowing into colonial coffers that did help the economy. I mean, these were significant amounts of money. In uh, 1684, for example, the governor of Jamaica, Thomas Lynch, said that he believed that just in the prior year that pirates had brought the equivalent of 80,000 pounds sterling Mm. worth of treasure into Boston. And to put that in perspective, that's at a time when an average captain of a merchant ship might only haul down about 72 pounds a year, and an average laborer would probably earn about 10 pounds per year. So this was a lot of money flowing through the American economy, especially at a time when the American economy was just hugging, or the American colonies were hugging the coast, and they were relatively, uh, had a relatively small population. So I think that it would have led to a colonial situation in which they were in more dire straits financially than was the case because of the pirates' contribution. And also, there were some instances in which pirates provided muscle during privateering attacks. The French attacked, French privateers attacked Newport, and there was a famous ex-pirate, Thomas Paine, who led up a force to fight them and run them out of the area and probably save Newport from being attacked. So there are a number of different ways in which the pirates benefited the colonies, just as the uh, the pirates were benefited by being able to settle in the colonies with their riches. But whether it would have had a such a dramatic impact on the future of American history, that uh, major events that came later would have been different, I don't know. It definitely would have changed the nature of of the colonies, the wealth of the colonies. And I think it would have lessened the tension, the building tension that was already taking place between the colonies and the mother country, which continued to simmer throughout the 1700s. And then of course erupted during the American revolution. Right. Yeah. It, it was, it was surprising almost how fast those people that were, appreciating all the the wealth that the pirates were bringing in how fast they turned on them when all of a sudden that wasn't a good idea anymore Um, (laughs) one one of the lessons of history and it's perhaps rather depressing because it still afflicts us today is that money and who's getting money and whose ox is being gored and who's benefiting from money whether obtained by legal or illegal means often determines how you feel about the activities that are taking place. Prior to the 1700s, the colonists viewed pirates as uh, as commercial angels, people bringing money to the colonies. So of course they supported them, and especially because in many instances they were related to these right. pirates. But then after the 1700s, and especially after the War of the Spanish Succession, it was a whole different story. Not only were the colonies more financially capable than they had been in the late 1600s. But now these pirates weren't going halfway around the world to attack, quote unquote, heathens and infidels, non-Christians in another ocean and bringing their riches back, which was something that the colonists had no 
real qualms with. But instead, now the pirates during the 17 teens and 1720s, the ones that I write about, they were afflicting English commerce. They were afflicting and attacking the merchant ships that were traveling between the colonies and the mother country, and even between the colonies and the Caribbean. In some cases, they were smuggling operations. But so you understand that what happens is now these colonists who had formerly seen nothing wrong with piracy now were alarmed by it because they were being negatively impacted. They no longer were benefiting from pirates. Their ships were being attacked by pirates. Yeah. So it's, it, it really, you have to, <laughs> as I said, today, I mean, throughout history, if you look at where the money is flowing and who's benefiting and who is not, that tells you a lot about how people are disposed towards what is happening, how people view what is happening. And money has often caused people to look the other way when illegal activity is taking place, especially <laughs> if you're benefiting from that illegal activity. <laughs> right. Just, just a few times throughout history, you know, <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, as I was looking over that, I was like, I was wondering why the pirates didn't think of that where they go, oh, if we start attacking our own guys, they're not going to shelter us like they used to. Or if they just weren't thinking that far and that was a gen different generation of pirates that just didn't have the, I mean, not that any of them were probably that bright to begin with, but didn't have the financial acumen to think about those types of things. And they were just going after whatever was close. Right. Uh, I, I, I think you, would, uh, you, you shouldn't give them too much credit for financial planning or personal <laughs> planning for that matter. And they were very different pirates from the ones that were operating in the late, uh, 1600s, the ones in the 1700s, you know, in the late 1600s, they viewed piracy. It wasn't a lifestyle. It was just an opportunity they took advantage of. Sure. And then many of them settled back down. In the 1700s, it became a lifestyle, an increasingly desperate lifestyle that often didn't have great payoffs. But for much of the 17 teens until about 1718, 1719, they did have this pirate redoubt uh, in Nassau and the Bahamas where they could go to New Providence, they can go down there and they could rest and relax, and then they could sally forth and attack ships. So there was at least one place they could return to, uh, but they, they weren't, uh, they, they were very different people than the ones that were operating in the late 1600s. And of course, they were like gamblers entering a casino. They thought they could win. They thought they were going to be successful like Henry Avery or Sir Francis Drake or... Uh, Henry Morgan, but just like gamblers going into a casino, they who overestimate their chances of success and underestimate their chance of failure, many of the pirates didn't have a winning hand and they didn't right. <laughs> uh, obtain a lot of treasure. And that's one of the things that fascinated me the most, especially in this early 1700s, when you read the accounts of these pirates who were captured. Now, granted, there, there might have been pirates we don't know much about who got away with more wealth than we know of. Uh -huh. I don't think that was the case because many of the pirates that got caught and got hanged during their trials and other accounts that were in the popular press of the day, it was really uh, amazing how mundane most of the materials they plundered from the ships they attacked sure. and uh, how little treasure they were able to accumulate it, it, yeah, a lot of it was just like, well, you know, we're really short on water, <laughs> drinking water <laughs> or, you know, uh, you got any salted beef. We could use some salted right. beef. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. was. Uh, yeah, almost. Yeah, just sort of scavenging more than anything at, at some points like that. You make a good point of pointing out that it wasn't just one thing that eventually took them all down. Because we kind of tend to think, oh, Woods Rogers showed up and it was over, you know, oh, uh, no. but it was the I, I was fascinated by the sort of bounty system uh, that the English crown uh, put together where it was, you know, if you right. if you if you rat out a pirate captain, here's some money for you. And if you <laughs> if you rat out a crew member, here's some money for you. And I imagine just like anything else following the money that probably, you know, turned the tide on. Oh, oh, there's money in it for me now. OK, well, now now you're not my friend anymore, pirate. Yeah, it was a whole, it was a multifaceted or multi pronged attack on piracy that ultimately worked and convinced these people or convinced more seafarers not to go into that uh, profession. But 
you don't want to make that case too strong because as long as there were people on the ocean going way back in history, there were pirates. And as we know sure. today, there are still pirates. Uh, I got a great email the other day from a merchant mariner who still to this day travels through the Indian and Pacific Ocean. Mm-hmm. And he told me that Lloyd's of London will refuse to insure your ship, your commercial ship, if you go through the Malacca Strait, uh, because yeah. there are so many pirates there that the risk of being attacked and having whatever your cargo is either stolen or you held for ransom is so great. So <laughs> piracy has been around as long as we've been going to sea, and unfortunately, I believe that it will be around well into the future. Because yeah. there are always going to be people who are either from countries such as Somalia and Venezuela right now that are in financial free fall and mm-hmm. people view piracy as a potential way to crawl out of that hole. Or there are going to be pirates as well that do it for the thrill or they're just bad people. I mean, it's, if you look on land, how many crimes are committed every day in every community, every state, every part of the world? And the vast majority of thieves don't get rich doing what they're doing. Right. I would I would venture most of them ultimately get caught and incarcerated, yet there still seems to be this unending fountain of people who are willing to do things that are patently illegal, dangerous, and often threaten and kill other people uh, despite the penalties that may come up later. And that was certainly the case with the pirates in the 1700s. They knew that there were more British warships coming over to patrol the East coast. They knew that the colonists were pissed off that these pirates were attacking their merchant ships. And there were instances in which colonists banded together, got their own armed ships and went out and beat pirates who were trying to plunder their ships. So they, knew all these things. They knew it was an increasingly desperate climate. Yet even into the 1720s, when piracy was clearly a losing game and the safe refuge of the Bahamas had been stripped from them, there were still pirates out there doing horrible things. In fact, some of the most outrageous and vicious and deranged pirates were the ones that came out in the 1720s. And that was probably in large part because you were scraping the bottom of the barrel. No (laughs) longer were you getting, quote unquote, entrepreneurs who were viewing piracy (laughs) as a way to get rich, but you were getting some real bad actors who were probably very frustrated at the limited amount of wealth that they were obtaining. And as a result, they took out their frustrations and their rage on some of their victims. Yeah, that's amazing. So this is not your first book. This is your 13th book, which is fantastic. And I looked, I was looking through the other stuff that you've written. And uh, like you mentioned, the lighthouses, um, some stuff about the fur and whaling trades, uh, invasive right. fish, fish species, Boston Harbor, all sorts of duck stamps. That was a surprising one. <laughs> um, so let I want to go back into your history a little bit and find out how you how you got to this place. So where where did you grow up and and how did you grow up? I was born in Queens, New York, and stayed there for the first four years of my life. And my parents moved far away, about 20, 30 miles away to <laughs> Roslyn, Roslyn, Long Island, on Long Island Sound. And I was okay. there until I was nine years old. And then my folks went across the Sound to Stanford, Connecticut, where I stayed through high school. And the reason that those places are important, particularly Roslyn and Stanford, as your listeners probably know, they're very close to Long Island Sound. So they're very close to the ocean. And I was really interested in the ocean as a kid. I was a super serious uh, shell collector. I was a real nerd. I used to read Scientific American all the time. My dad was a physicist, so I was sort of into science anyway. And I started collecting shells very seriously. In fact, when I was in high school, I wrote a 150-page paper on the mollusks of Long Island Sound, wow. two, chapters <laughs> of which, two chapters of which got published in a seashell magazine. And when I applied to college, uh, my uh, professed career goal was to become a malacologist or a scientist who studies seashells. 
Okay. So I got, when I got to college, I went to Brown University, which is in Rhode Island, and I was a biology major. But after two years, I took a year off and I was getting disillusioned with biology, not because I didn't love science, but I realized that I wasn't very good in the lab. And <laughs> I don't think mm. I would be very, a very good scientist. I preferred reading about it than performing. Uh, science. So I took a year off and I was interested in the environment. And this is in the early, you know, late 70s, early 80s, the environmental movement sure. was, you know, not too old. And uh, Brown had just created a center for environmental studies. So I decided, well, uh, science is important in environmental policy. Maybe I could look into environmental policy as an option. So I took a year off. I worked at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute to try one more shot at science during the day. But at night, I was a cook at the Fishmonger Cafe in Woods Hole. And I like cooking better than doing the science. So I quit my <laughs> science job. And I used to cook at night. And on, at the day, uh, during the day, I'd hang out on the beach. And then I went down to Washington, D.C., where I worked for a very liberal Republican senator named Lowell Weicker from Connecticut. He became famous during the Watergate hearings. And this is just when acid rain was a big issue. I don't uh. know if your listeners even remember acid rain. Sure. But I was working for him as an unpaid intern. I was cooking at night at a restaurant to make ends meet. And then they needed somebody in the office to cover uh, – environmental issues. They didn't have anybody. So they started sending me to hearings. And then this acid rain thing got real big. And I ended up writing the senator's position paper on acid rain, hmm. which he was in favor of controlling emissions. So anyway, uh, they started pay they started paying me. I said, oh, this is great. And then I stayed in Washington and I worked as a door-to-door -door environmental canvasser. And uh, then I finally spent the, the rest of the year, I was a nature counselor at a camp up in uh, the Adirondacks. So that, that year off was my transition into environmental policy. So I got back to school. I added a major environmental policy, and I decided I wanted to be a professor. So I knew I had to go get a PhD. But at first, I worked, I worked for a consulting firm. I did environmental policy stuff down in D.C. Then I went to the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, where I did more environmental stuff. And that was the first time that I wrote a book. I decided I was interested in writing. I'd always written op-eds and sort of things about different subjects. And I saw an advertisement for a Know Your Government series of books, which was put out by Chelsea House Publishers, as I remember. Uh -huh. And I, so I wrote to them. I said, hey, I'd love to write the book about the Environmental Protection Agency. And they said, sorry, that's already been taken. But how about the United States Fish and Wildlife Service? And <laughs> okay. I said, I know, I know nothing about the Fish and Wildlife Service, but sure. So I wrote this little textbook on the Fish and Wildlife Service. And it was published. And it was kind of cool because the introduction to it was written by Arthur Schlesinger Jr. But he wrote the introduction for all 50 of the books. So it wasn't special to me. But I got this sort of nibble of what writing a book was about. I graduated from Yale. I decided I still want to be a professor. I went off to MIT uh, to do urban studies and planning, but really environmental policy. And I, again, suddenly had an epiphany. I didn't want to be a professor. I loved teaching. And I actually uh -huh. taught some courses while I was at MIT and I TA'd a bunch. But I liked the teaching, but I knew I wasn't going to be capable of writing these deep uh, hypothesis testing environmental policy articles and books that would get me tenure at a good university. So after four years of working really hard and having a difficult time, I contemplated dropping out. And I, I remember going into my, uh, my main advisor's office and uh, giving him 400 pages of a draft. Uh, he wasn't, wasn't my main advisor. He was my secondary advisor. But giving uh, 400 pages of a draft of my dissertation about the cleanup of Boston Harbor and the role of the courts in cleaning up the harbor. And he looked at it. He goes, Herrick, there's no way in hell I'm going to read a dissertation that's 1,500 pages because it was only the first few chapters. And then he said, there's no hypothesis testing in here. There's no political science. And then he looked at me. And he said, Eric, you know, you're a good writer. Why don't you drop out of the program and become a writer? Uh -huh. And I looked at him and I said, the only thing more pathetic than a PhD student is a writer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, I've got to finish this because I paid for my graduate school, both my master's and my PhD. I had invested four years 
my wife now, my fiance at the time said, you can quit, but I never want to hear another word about it. And I, you know, I knew I couldn't keep that promise. Uh So I finally, I finished my program and, oh, by the way, the guy who said that to me that I should quit, drop out of the program, Larry Bacow, he's now president of Harvard university. Great guy. (laughs) (laughs) So anyway, I finished the PhD. I didn't apply for a single teaching job. And I, I started doing environmental stuff. I bounced. If you looked at my resume, you couldn't, you'd couldn't. think I couldn't keep a job, which may be true. I get sort of bored <laughs> easily. And I worked at the National Marine Fisheries Service, at the Environmental Protection Agency, the National Transportation Safety Board, the National Wildlife Federation. It was just all over the place. So finally, in the late 1900s, early 2000s, I had already written a couple of books, including that duck stamp book, which was really fun to write. Uh, no, wait. So wait, why, why duck stamps? Why why that oh, subject? The, well, in the, in the mid-1990s, after I got out of my PhD program, I knew that I was more interested in writing. So even though I had all these jobs – the pieces of those jobs that I enjoyed the most was when I had to write something. So on the side on my own time, I said, you know, I ought to start writing some articles. Uh And I I was a big collector at the time of all sorts of things. And uh, I decided to start collecting stamps. Okay. (laughs) And, And then I found, I learned about this duck stamp program. I didn't know anything about it, but it suddenly clicked. This duck stamp program was one of the largest sources of income for the federal government to buy national wildlife refuges. Really? So it forced, yeah, it forces anybody who's hunting migratory waterfowl in the United States to purchase a stamp. Now the stamp, I think costs 15 or $20 and 98% of the value of that stamp, which in turn becomes your hunting license for okay. these migratory waterfowl, 98% of the money that you spend on that goes into purchasing the very habitat that those waterfowl need to survive. Huh. So here I had this perfect program that I knew nothing about. It combined my new interest in stamp collecting, which I no longer have, and, <laughs> and my long my longstanding interest in environmental issues, plus my interest in writing. So I pitched an idea to the American philatelist magazine, which is the premier stamp magazine for your listeners who don't know that already, about writing a book on duck stamps, uh, writing, not a book, writing an article on duck stamps. And they said, sure, write the article. So I went down to the Bureau of Engraving, where Bureau of Engraving and Printing, where they do the engravings for these duck stamps and where the, and where they print uh, duck stamps. And I learned all about it. And I wrote this very long article about the federal duck stamp program. And then out of the blue, the nation's number one duck stamp dealer. There's actually, there are actually people that specialize on selling <laughs> duck stamps because they're very popular. Not only the duck stamps, but the paintings and the prints of the paintings that go on the duck stamp because every year there's a competition uh, for whose painting is going to go on that year's duck stamp. And in okay. years past, in the 1980s, the person who was lucky enough to be selected as the artist of that year could make upwards of a million dollars selling reprints or lithographs, essentially, not lithographs, but re- uh-huh. reprints, Holy cow. Uh, little posters of their their painting. So I wrote this article, and then this guy who's the premier duck stamp dealer contacts me, and he says, hey, you want to write a book together? (laughs) So we started talking, and we agreed to team up. We really didn't write the book together. I wrote the whole book, but he provided a lot of the information and all the expertise. So I wrote this book, and that book, believe it or not, it won the gold medal at the American Philatelist Society stamp show in 2001. So I said, oh, not only can I write books, but maybe they'll get some attention. It sold pretty well. And it was right about that time, 2000, 2001, that I turned to my wife, Jennifer, and I said, I'd like to be a full-time writer. And after she stopped laughing, she (laughs) she said, okay, but if you want to be a full-time writer, you need to put aside at least a year's worth of your salary sure. as a, a backup. So it took me about five years. I kept writing books. Uh, some of the ones you mentioned, I wrote a book that was sort of based on my dissertation on the cleanup of Boston Harbor called Political Waters. And in the summer of 2007, my wife and I are watching the TV show House on the couch. And she turns to me and she said, you can quit your job. I said, <laughs> what? 
you can quit your job. And the reason that that timing was important is that's right after I had published uh, the book Leviathan, the history of whaling in America, which is probably the best selling of all of my books. But hopefully I think it's going to be eclipsed by Black Flags, Blue Waters. But Leviathan had just come out. It had gotten a lot of great reviews. It was doing really well. And as a result, I got a two book contract from Norton to write two more books. Hmm. So that contract and the advance that that came with, plus the amount of money I had put aside, was enough to make my wife, who handles all of our finances, uh, say it's worth taking a risk. And I've been a full time writer ever since 2007. And I've got to give complete thanks to my wife because I couldn't have done that if she hadn't supported me, not only emotionally, but financially, she works, she has a great job and she believes in me being a writer. And uh, my salary ever since then, 2007 has gone up, gone down, gone up, gone down. It's like a seesaw, <laughs> but we've managed to cobble together the life that we want. And our two kids are in college right now. And we're not, we don't have to declare bankruptcy. So things are working out <laughs> so far. <laughs> and that's how I, that's a long answer to how I became a, a writer. It's a, a long and uh, strange trip, I guess, in the yeah. Grateful Dead, where that it's been. Yeah, and, and those are always the the most interesting career stories anyway. But what I like is that uh, – and because I, I think the most creative people always go through that process of, oh, I'm, I got to do this. Oh, there's this part <laughs> of this that I really don't like. And then they head off in some other direction that's related to that. And uh, I'm I'm the same way. I've uh, I started out in music, and and now I now I do comedy most of the time, and I write and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so you do just kind of pick up all these little skills, and it's uh, it's it is always like, it, do you ever get the feeling of this is really great now? What's next? <laughs> I know I'm not probably going to like this in five years. Do you ever go through that part of it? Oh, I, I before I started writing. Seriously, yes, all the time. I was always wondering, why am I doing this job now? and What can I find next? But thankfully, at least as of right now, when I'm talking to you, the only thing that I want to do next is write another book and then another book. I, uh -huh. I hope that my future, as long as I am allowed to stay on earth and still capable of doing work, that I can continue to write books. I don't foresee another major career change that doesn't involve writing somehow. And I would guess that if you came back 10 years from now and interviewed me, I would have written, you know, three or four more books in that time. And we could talk about those and they'd be on totally different topics. I'm working on a book right now on hurricanes. Mm -hmm. So I sort of bounce around. And if you're interested, I could tell you more about the process of picking book topics, which is always interesting. But but uh, to answer your question more directly, I think I found the one thing that I uh, love doing. It's the best job I've ever had. It's by far the hardest job I've ever had. And also, I have to add, I have the worst boss, which is me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so I can't blame anybody right. but me. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I know that feeling very, very well. <laughs> yeah, my my boss is an idiot too. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I and, and that's great. Uh, I I love uh, when somebody's in that place, and I love when I'm in that place. And then I sometimes will get to a place where I go, man, this is really great now, and I wonder if I'm still going to like doing this in ten years. Um, because with yeah. any of those things, I do know people who uh, don't like doing what they're doing. I know comics who hate doing comedy at this point, but it's the only thing they know how to do. So I always kind of have that in the back of my brain uh, a little bit where it makes me kind of look ahead and, and always be looking for possibilities and opportunities and things like that to kind of branch out and keep things interesting. Um, because I, I, I'm the same way. I get bored if I'm doing the same thing over and over and over again, um, including writing or comedy or music or teaching or whatever it is. So um, it's, it's good when you can, when you find your place and, and uh, you're happy there. So, Congratulations. I, 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 <laughs> I, yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more because I have plenty of friends who are doing things that uh, don't fulfill them. And uh -huh. some of them are, are stuck for, I mean, there's a whole bunch of reasons, good reasons. When I was in the government, there was a phrase that was used. If you got to, at too high of a level, which uh -huh. is probably where I was, where you're earning a very good salary and many of the people in my area of government 
didn't have advanced degrees at the time. Uh, and, you know, they probably couldn't earn quite as much doing environmental policy in the private sector. So, and this is not a knock against them. I'm a big fan of federal workers. Most federal workers do good work and work really hard. They're, uh-huh. of course, just like any industry, there are federal workers who lounge around and don't do much work, and I wish they could be fired. But <laughs> I'm a fan of the federal government, and certainly a couple of the agencies that I worked for. But there's this phrase that was called the silk uh, uh, handcuffs. Basically, mm. if you got too high on a salary range, you were sort of stuck there for your whole career because the prospect of you leaving the government, leaving the security of the government and a very nice paycheck that came every two weeks and finding a job doing environmental policy, which was the area I was in, uh-huh. or even environmental science in the private sector or the nonprofit world and being and earning as much money, it was a difficult proposition. Sure. And Life is tough and money is nice. I'm a big fan of money. It gives you freedom to do things that you want to do. So again, it's not a knock against them. I'm just saying that a a lot of people, a lot of people are in jobs that if they had their druthers, they would probably want to do something else. But the reality is of life make that very difficult for many people And nobody should look down on those people for sticking with jobs that help them pay their mortgage and send their kids to school and go on the vacations they want. Uh, I think it's a very noble thing to do. But I'm very cognizant of the fact that I'm in a position now that uh, I I should savor because a lot of people don't get to this position. And as of right now, I love what I'm doing. It's, It's very hard, but I've got a lot of freedom. And it's a team effort. Again, I couldn't have done it without my wife and my kids' support for that matter. The support definitely helps. It's funny because I just had the same silk handcuffs conversation with a comedian friend about cruise ship gigs. Because <laughs> 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 I haven't done them and he'd done a bunch. He was like, just don't. He said, because they pay really well and you'll never get out of them. Um <laughs> And and like Bill Burr had said, you are never as far away from the entertainment industry as you are when you're on a cruise ship. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was very it was a very similar conversation, which I thought was funny because you brought it up a little bit. Uh, your your research process. What what did your research process look like for this new pirate book? Considering that you were going in not having a a detailed knowledge of the subject. Yeah, I, I follow a pretty routine process because almost every book I've written, with the exception of the one on Boston Harbor, really, I, I write books on topics that I don't know a lot about. Uh-huh. Now, tw- 15 years ago, when I was 15, actually 20 some odd years ago, when I started writing books, in order to get a lot of primary materials, you had to go to specialized libraries and travel and or send letters to librarians and hope that they would help you out photocopying something. What's happened in the last 20 years with the internet is absolutely, uh, I don't know, miraculous is too strong a word, but <laughs> it's amazing for researchers, certainly historical researchers. Nowadays, and this is the process that I follow with Black Flags, Blue Waters, and probably the same process pretty much for my last two or three books, because it, it's been that way for at least six or seven years. Uh-huh. So much stuff, so much material is digitized by all these specialized libraries. For example, I for Black Flags, Blue Waters, I went to London and I used the British archives for a week. Okay, But you know what the truth is? I didn't have to do that. I sort of wanted to do that sure. because <laughs> the number the number one primary res- resource that I used for this book, I would argue, is the British archives because every single letter, every piece of paper sent from the American colonies by customs officials, by governors, by merchants, everything that was sent across the ocean to the crown, to the parliament, to anybody involved in the government – got archived. And the British archives did something wonderful many years ago. They digitized all of those letters, hundreds of thousands of them. And not only are they digitized, you can search them by keyword. So sitting at my terminal at home, I could basically search through a hundred years of history. And if I wanted to find out, well, who wrote about Blackbeard or who wrote about Thomas II or who wrote about Henry Avery? I just have to plug in their names. And all of a sudden, I've got 35 different letters that were written over a span of who knows how many years. Mm. And then I can download those or copy them and use them as a resource. So that's one thing is that the internet 
and also Google Books, you can get almost any book you want that was published in the 1700s or sure. 1800s on Google, and they're fully searchable and they're full text available. So I was able to get these amazing primary as well as secondary materials just sitting at my computer. But that's not all I did. I also tend to buy a library uh, about the subject I'm working on. Uh-huh. I bought I bought about 60 pirate books, a lot okay. of them out of print, <laughs> a lot of them out of print, but not all of them. And I put them right behind my desk in a bookshelf. I'm looking at some of them right now. They're being replaced by hurricane books, which I'm working <laughs> on now. And after I'm done with a book, uh, what do I do? I often get rid of those books. In fact, I've given over 300 books to the Massachusetts Historical Society uh, that came from my whaling research and my fur trade research and some oh. of my China research. And then the lighthouse research, I bought over 100 books, but the library didn't want it. So I gave 100 books to uh, the American Lighthouse uh, Foundation nice. and so they can do whatever they want with them. And I don't know what I'm going to do with these pirate books. I'll keep them for a little while longer, but some of them I'll probably give away. Yeah. So if anybody wants a small pirate library, they can contact me. <laughs> so so that so so there's one thing, one element is being on the internet and, and using that as a resource. Another element is having my own library. I also go to a lot of libraries. My local library has an a consortium with about 40 other libraries all around Boston. So I have access to a lot of materials. And then finally, the 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 final sort of rung on my ladder of research is I'm fortunate enough to have library access at Harvard University. Uh So Harvard's Widener Library, which is one of the greatest libraries in the entire world, I would probably go in there about once a month and use their both their databases, but also I'd order a, a, a lot of books and look at them and make copies of stuff and it was just a wonderful wonderful resource so yeah. th- those those are the all the ways that i sort of pulled together the research and i have to add that the difficulty for a researcher and i can only speak for myself but i'm sure it's the case for all historical research researchers nowadays the difficulty is not finding enough information unless you're working on a very very narrow thing sure. the difficulty is being absolutely overwhelmed and swamped by the amount of information that is out there. Right. Yeah. And I have to constantly battle against the concept that, you know, I, I don't want better to be the enemy of good enough in sure. a sense. And what helps me is I've got a contract and I've got to earn some semblance of a living. And I try to <laughs> hand in books pretty much every two years. So just like your own imminent death focuses your mind <laughs> A, a, a contract <laughs> deadline focuses your mind. And, and I have another added uh, – it's not a secret weapon. I, I know for a fact that if nothing else, all of my education, my undergraduate, my master's, and my PhD gave me one really good skill. I'm very good and pretty fast at collecting a lot of disparate information and synthesizing it. Uh, I don't know if I had that naturally, or it's just that I did so many research papers over all those years I was in school that I just got good at it. But that helps. Sure. And that's probably the number one question that I'm asked by would-be writers. They say, "How do you? How, how do you? You know, a lot of my books cover three, four hundred years. This one, uh-huh. the pirate book, only covered about a hundred years at sure. most. But it's tough. It's tough for me, even though I think I have some skills doing it." It's always tough. And there are stories that I left out of this book that maybe if I wrote it at a different time, I would put in. Uh, But as I write more books, I get better at picking the stories that make the most sense for the narrative arc. And the other thing I have to add, and hopefully this will give hope to all those people in your audience who have dreams of writing a book one day, I have no history background. I'm called an historian. The last history class that I took was when I was a freshman at Brown University. I (laughs) I haven't taken another history course. I wish I could go back and take more history courses. But so to – I mean I have basic knowledge of history because I'm an educated guy. Sure. But I'm not – even though I'm called an historian, I'm not a PhD historian, nor am I a trained writer. I did not 
your your listeners might know that Brown University is one of those <laughs> hippie universities, as some people <laughs> call it, where that don't have any requirements. So when I went there, I didn't take a single English class after huh. I got out of high school. Again, if I could go back and I knew what I was doing now, I probably would have taken some more English uh, classes, especially since my wife, during the early years of my writing, she used to call herself the kamikaze, as in she had to elim- <laughs> eliminate all the commas I kept putting in at inappropriate places in my writing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm guilty so, of that. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, I mean, so there's hope if you if I, I really do believe what's been attributed to Edison. Uh, I know he said it in some one form or another, you know, work or success is 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. I don't know what the, I don't know what the percentages really are in different people's lives, but I can tell the, tell you if I believe strongly that if you have a dream, if you have a goal and you're basically a smart person, you got to be basically a smart person. You can't, you know, you're going to have a difficult time if you don't have some of the basic tools, but more important than that, if you're motivated and willing to go through all the pain and time that it takes to achieve your goal, I think everybody's got a good shot. That doesn't mean they're going to get it. And certainly in writing, I speak to so many people who want to be writers and I tell them the truth. It's a very difficult career to have. It's even more difficult if you hope to make what anybody would consider a reasonable income. Sure. But it's wonderful if you could do it. It's just like being an artist. I imagine it's just like being a comic. I, I love comics. I, I love listening to their their shows and going to their shows, but I don't know the ins and outs of your business, but I imagine that the competition is fierce and oh, yeah. the money the money only rains down on people at the very top. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's really no different in, uh, it's funny cause I, we mostly think about it in terms of creative art forms like writing or music or performance or whatever sort. And I was speaking with uh, a lady the other day who was a zookeeper and she was telling me that like, yeah, it's really competitive to get in and then the pay is garbage, but to get to play with elephants. And I was like, <laughs> Oh, Absolutely. any fun job is going to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that. That makes sense. I, I would have thought that for zookeeper. Think how few zoos there are. Right. And sure. It, it's, it's just like, you know, if you want to be a professor of uh, 16th century English poetry, I don't know, maybe there are three, <laughs> p- three jobs in the world that you could get and Nobody in those jobs is going to retire for 20 or 30 years. Right. You know, it's not as bad as that for comics and writers, but you, you know how many books are written every year in English? There are like over 200,000 books are published. Sure. There are, ten, there are thousands and thousands of books published every year just on American history alone. The difficulty of first coming up with a good idea, second, writing a book that's worthy of being published, third, once your book is published, having it be noticed by anybody other than your friends and family, sure. and four, then having what's anybody would consider, you know, moderate or real success, there are enormous obstacles to that. That's Absolutely. why I have inc- I have incredible respect for people who are writers, and I guess myself, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, I also have incredible respect. I know a number of people who are artists, uh, painters, or sculptors, and I see what they have to go through to make ends meet or to try to achieve their dream. And it's tough. And I can only imagine how hard, well, and, and, not, and it's not that I can only imagine it because I've actually read articles or seen documentaries where they talk about the difficult road that many comics have to travel oh, sure. starting at the bottom of the circuit in the small, you know, the small room at one in the morning with four people there who aren't <laughs> even listening to you and trying to get noticed. I, it's just amazing. You think about these people who become a success. And I'm not just talking about the, the Seinfelds or the, you know, whoever you hear about, the big uh-huh. names, but there's a whole level of c- comedians who I probably wouldn't know their names, but they're successful and sure. they do good gigs and they make a lot of people laugh and they really deserve respect because they're the ones that stuck through all the crap you have to go through to make it. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And sometimes the crap is still there. Either way, um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is. Even for 
and I'm not putting myself in this category. I know a couple of writers who are like super successful uh -huh. nonfiction writers, you know, New York Times bestselling writers. And even they still have numerous complaints yep. about their profession, about how they're being treated by their publisher, perhaps, about why this review didn't happen. There's always <laughs> something. There's always something. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. My, uh, my girlfriend constantly marvels that how much I can complain about my job. <laughs> she's like, she's like, just shut up. You're a comedian. Just be, be funny. Yeah. <laughs> so that, yeah, that's really great. That's I'm, I'm, I'm happy for where you are. I think that's really very cool. So the, uh, where is the best place that you want people to go find your, your current book, black flags, blue waters at, I imagine it's in all the, all the bookie places, but do you have a preferred outlet? No, I don't have a preferred one. I mean, you can, you can obviously find it, online at Amazon or barnesandnoble.com or booksamillion.com or Target or Walmart. I mean, all the online outlets where people normally buy books, but I'm also a big fan of independent bookstores. And even if your local independent bookstore doesn't have the book, they can certainly order it. Many of them right now will have it because the book's only a month old and it's doing pretty well. I, I know, for example, there are a bunch of Costco's in Louisiana, Texas, Florida, Massachusetts, and some other states that are carrying the book. I don't know nice. how much longer they will be. I, I know that when the book came out, Barnes & Noble, all the Barnes & Noble stores had the book on their front table for a short amount of time. Wow. I, I, think that's, I think that's over. So getting it, there's no obstacle to getting it. You just might have to look a couple of places or ask your independent bookseller to order it. But I also would want people, if they want to learn more about my other books and see a kind of fun site that I put together, they can look at my website. And the address for that is www.ericjdolan.com. And that's E-R-I-C-J-A-Y-D-O-L-I-N.com. And if you go there, there's a bio of me. There's a page of fun pictures. There's an excerpt. The introduction to Black Flags, Blue Waters can be read on that on that site. There's a list of all my events. I've already gone through about 30 of my talks. I've got uh -huh. another 20 or so left, mainly in New England now, but I'm going down to Miami. I'm going to Virginia. I'm going to D.C. So if people want to see where I'm speaking, they can go to the events tab. And there's also dedicated pages to each of my books. And almost, I think every single page has a link to the introduction from the book. I think for most of them nice. and pictures from the book and other stuff. So that's a fun, I mean, I don't know if it's a fun site, but it was fun putting it together Good. and it gives a lot of background information. But the last plea that I would make to your listeners is and this is not specific to me, is just if you want people to keep writing books, go out and buy books. It, uh -huh. it helps a lot. And if you buy a book and you read a book, whether it's mine or somebody else's, and you enjoy it, tell your friends. Word of mouth is yes. the best way to sell books or write reviews on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or whatever. But uh, I'm a big fan of reading. I'm a big fan of writing. <laughs> but I'm also a big fan of earning a living. So I hope right. people take a look. To, I hope people take a look at my book, either this one, Black Flags, Blue Waters, or some of my earlier books. And even if they're not interested in buying it, if they know somebody else who, oh, this would be a great book for them, then please let them know. Nice. Yes, absolutely. Word of mouth is king. Absolutely. Well, Eric, this has been super fun, man. I'm going to make yeah. sure that all that is in the show notes, all the links and all that kind of good stuff. Okay. And I appreciate you taking the time to do it. And there it is, friends. That is my interview with Eric J. Dolan. And you can find him on his website at Eric with a C, J, J, A, Y, Dolan, D, O, L, I, N. Uh, also, uh, no relation to uh, PJ Dolan from last week's show. Who knew? Yeah. Did you like the show? Did you did you find something you wanted to jump in on? Some bit of conversation that where you had something to add to that that you wanted to just go, ooh, ooh, I got a thing I want to say. Come on over to Facebook, facebook.com slash under the crossbones. Say it to us there. Tell us what you thought. Tell us what you want to add to the conversation. We are open to talking with you about it. Especially if you did you learn something. I learned some. I learned quite a few things reading this book. Uh, really, really good one. So again, go to ericjdolan.com to find out what he is up to. If you would like to help support this show, 
That would be amazing of you. Uh, there's an easy way to do that. Go to underthecrossbones.com slash support. Right there, there's a little PayPal box where you can drop a donation in there of any sort that you, uh, any amount that you think is uh, is appropriate. Uh, maybe like the price of a bottle of rum. Whatever your favorite bottle of rum is, take the price of that and just send me the donation because uh, I don't drink. So the rum doesn't do me any good. But if you want to uh, donate, that's a good sort of benchmark you can go to, or less, or more, or whatever. I'm not going to put any limits on you. You're a pirate. Uh, There's an Amazon banner on that page as well. If you're doing your Christmas shopping, this is what you do. You go click the Amazon banner at underthecrossbones.com slash support. It takes you over to Amazon, and you buy... Your, all your Christmas stuff, right? All your holiday gifts, all your what, your Hanukkah gifts, all your whatever you're getting. Uh, buy yourself something nice. Get yourself a present. You deserve it. And then Amazon kicks me back a tiny percent of that. It doesn't change your price at all. It doesn't cost you anything, uh, but it does help support the show. So you can do that. And if you want to be a sponsor of the show, that's easy and cheap to do, like Parada Clothing or Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast. Just, uh, it's cheap. It's easy. We can hook you up. Go to underthecrossbones.com slash support. We'll make it happen. Speaking of which, we're sponsored today by Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast. Yeah, WKKC-DB playing the best music of today's hits and yesterday's classics. And Pirate Radio Talk playing the best pirate shows, including Under the Crossbones, 24-7, all commercial free. To listen, go to PirateRadioTheTreasureCoast.com or hit the App Store and get, uh, download the Pirate Radio WKKC-DB uh, app. That's for the music station. Or for the talk station, go to PirateRadioTC.com or download the Pirate Radio Talk app from your favorite app store, and that'll get you there. Or if you don't even want to download nothing or go nowhere, just pick up your phone and say, OK, Google, play me Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast, and boom, it'll be right there. Or your Alexa, or just scream at an appliance. Just yell at a lamp and say, play me Pirate Radio, the Treasure Coast, and your lamp will absolutely ignore you. But if you do it with your phone or uh, or your Alexa thingy that's listening to you constantly, it will do that for you. So you can scream at the lamp, but it, it mixed results is going to come from that. All brought to you by iTreasure Radio, the very best digital media from independently owned stations at iTreasureRadio.com. I have an ebook for you too. Speaking of books, if you're out going, you're going to go get Eric J. Dolan's book, Black Flags and Blue Waters. I got one for you too, and it's a freebie. It's Pirates of Panama or Buccaneers of America, whichever title you prefer, by Alexander X. Squemlin, first released in 1678. So remember, during the interview, we were talking about those sort of primary resources that he was talking about that you can you can get your hands on. Here's a way to get your hands on one. Uh, Alexander Squemelin was a doctor who ended up on pirate ships and wrote about his firsthand experiences. It's a fantastic book. I've got a cool, nice little ebook version for you that you can get at underthecrossbones.com. Click the free ebook button. You can get it right there. Or uh, if you got your phone handy, uh, you can text the word pirate and your email address to 94253. Yeah, it's the same code as Parada Clothing, uh, but that's because, duh, it's the obvious one to use. Text the word pirate and your email address to 94253. Or if you want that product clothing discount, you can text the same word pirate to 21000. That's how that works because we're all using the same code. It's all good. All right. That is our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Happy Thanksgiving if you are doing that in America. Uh, happy Blackbeard Dead Day uh, everywhere else in the world. And uh, it's going to be good. Again, go check out ericjdolan.com find out more about black flags and blue waters and duck stamps and hurricanes and lighthouses and all the other crazy stuff he's writing about it's good stuff uh i have a cool interview set up for tomorrow that uh, i'm not gonna tell you about until it's actually in the can and after that oh it's been a tough time getting some people scheduled because everybody's busy this time of year uh but i'm doing my best to get some people scheduled for interviews and in the can so if i have if you're a person that I've talked to recently and you're listening to this, hey, get back to me. Let's get that scheduled. So uh, I can't tell you exactly what I have coming up. I don't know, but we're going to have some stuff coming up and it's going to be fun. All right. So uh, until next week, uh, keep your uh, keep Jolly Roger uh, flying high. Uh, go sit at the kids table at Thanksgiving to avoid the political talk. That may not even be true. Uh, your four-year-old's going to be like, do you hear what he said on Twitter? And no, you don't need that. Anyway, just everybody keep your mouth shut, stuff some turkey in it, and have a good Thanksgiving. I'll see you next week.